So welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Sergio Mena. I come from Swiss Co, Switzerland. And um, before starting, I made myself a promise is not to say, again, QT, but cute. I'll try to do it during the presentation. <laughs> OK. So let's start. Um, when, when I tell my, my friends that we're using Qt, when I tell my geek friends that we're using Qt, the first question I get is, so why is the kind of GUI that you guys are, are working on? And this is all I can show them. This is the logo of MSI. MSI is the project on, under which we are working. That's all I can show them. Just to say that we are the example of somebody that is heavily using Qt, whereas we don't have any GUI to present. We are actually middleware. OK, so let me just um, uh, you know, say a few words about the summary of my talk. So I'm going to start presenting MediaNet, what MediaNet is, which is the big umbrella project under, under which we are working. What is MSI, which is part of MediaNet? That's where I come from. Then I will explain a little bit how we chose and fought for QT internally. And I will briefly present some extensions that we, um, that we had to build and that we will be very happy to contribute it for the Qt community. So MediaNet. If you go to the MediaNet web page, you will find this definition of MediaNet. MediaNet is a system that is media, endpoint, and network aware. So translated to English, that means that you have a network which has advanced features, and you have the application developers that want to leverage those features from the network. Okay? So MediaNet is a common effort within Cisco to make that happen. I will say a few words about, about it later. Now, MSI, media, media Services Interface. This is the team where I come from in Switzerland. In this slide, you can see a rough architecture of the whole MSI. So there are people here in San Jose that are working on advanced features on the you know, networking elements, routers, switches, doing really, really advanced stuff there. And we have, maybe um, more familiar to this conference, people that are working on endpoints uh, writing bright applications, okay? Now, the problem is that um, those who are working here, if they want to leverage the network services, they have to talk the network languages. The network languages are protocols. They have to know and implement and use those protocols. And this is where the MSI, Media Services Interface, the thing we're working on, comes into the scene. We are talking the network language, southbound. We are supporting protocols. And then we are abstracting that, that into an API, you know, which is the language of the application developers, which is APIs, function calls, data structures, et cetera. So that allows an, an application developer to actually leverage the network without having to, to talk its language. In a few words, if you are developing a nice application for these endpoints, but you want to leverage the advanced features that your Cisco network is offering to you, then MSI is the door you have to knock at. So these are some of the endpoints we are already running on. So we can see you know, IP cameras, mainly for physical surveillance. We have DMPs, digital media players, which are usually you know, uh, in, on public places for advertisements. So we, we got our daemon running there as well. Teleconference endpoints. Uh, this is actually a Tanber where you know, we, we, um, you know, we, we managed to, to get our, our daemon running in there. So, and then this is actually, this stands for WebEx. I don't know if. Can you raise your hand, those who know WebEx, please? OK, so for those who don't know what WebEx is, is first, at least within Cisco, if you want to set up a meeting, and at least one of the uh, components of the meeting is going to work remote, WebEx is the answer to that. It's going you know, to um, handle the you know, slide sharing, chat, questions, and so everything for you. So the last versions of, of WebEx are able to leverage advanced net network features because they are running our daemon. So let me just get a little bit more technical. These are some numbers of our project. So um, at the t uh, in an important time for us was May 2010 when we decided to switch to Qt. Okay? At that time, we already had 18,000 lines of C++ code and 11,000 lines of C code because our, actually our APIs officially are C. That's the culture in Cisco. Now, in September 2011, so more than one year and a half later, we can, we can assume this is today. We have actually grown tenfold. We are now on 
113,000 lines of code, or C++, of C++ code, and 21,000 lines of um, source, C, C source code, okay? Um, this is also counting uh, our extensive suite of unit test code. Every class we do uh, is actually unit tested, and these tests are actually executed for every single commit that every single developer uh, is contributing to the source code. We're also using Python for feature and system tests. These are more holistic tests where you get actually the whole um, system and you exercise its API, which means API on the, you know, on the northbound and protocols on the southbound. The operating systems we are supporting are Linux and Windows. Um, all the embedded devices we have, they rely on Linux. Um, and we know we don't, we're not officially supporting it, but we, could, we know that we could easily do it with uh, any, any flavor of, you know, some flavors of, of BSD, uh, BSD Unix. Um, we did some background you know, tests, manual model tests, to, you know, to convince us that we can do it. So far, we're not doing it because so, so none of our clients uh, require it. The architecture we're supporting is x86, AMD64, PowerPC, ARM, and MIPS. The embedded part of this is, as I said, running Linux. And you have to deal with the diversity of compilers, old compilers, uh, versions of compilers, how they deal with templates, et cetera, et cetera. The network protocol, so the, remember my slide about the architecture, the, the languages we're talking to the networks so far, because it is, it is growing, are CDP, Cisco Discovery Protocol. We are using it for neighbor and location information. DHCP for auto registration, RSVP. This is a typical, you know, um, typical protocol for bandwidth preservation. We are actually using some non-standard extensions to it, in order, for instance, to troubleshoot a media transmission in the network. MSI to MSI, which is a TCP-based uh, secure channel for two of our demons to talk to each other. And then this is very recent. We're working on a REST interface over HTTPS based on certific certificates. Well, actually, you can manage uh, your daemon. Actually, if you are a network manager in, in you, and you have the REST activated on your daemons, you can actually manage any daemon that is running in the corporate network. Okay, so let me just say a few words about the moment we met QT, okay? So, so f at, at that time, we were using a low-level C cross-platform library. It was, it's called actually CrossOS. It's an internal Cisco effort. And cross is, stands like stands as cross-platform, okay? So, the first clients were requiring Linux, and this, was, this thing was ported to Linux, so it was okay, it served its purpose, but then sometime, sometime later, uh, WebEx came into the scene, and WebEx, they support several platforms, but 80% of their user base are running some sort of Windows, Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 7. So for them, it was crucial that our daemon could run on Windows. So we spent some time trying to understand how could do, we could do that, and one of the, th the first problems we found is that this cross-platform library had not been ported itself to Windows, so it was useless for us to try to leverage it in order to run it on Windows. So that's when, you know, there was a study there, there were things like Boost that popped up, but in the end we decided to go for Qt and the fight started. I'm gonna talk about it a bit, a bit later. So as a first experiment, we did a rough port of, Qt, a rough port of our application to use to using Qt rather than the C platform that we were using, and we managed to do that in three weeks. Remember, there was nearly 20,000 20, lines of C++ code at the time. In three weeks, we got it working on Qt, and as a side effect, working on, on Windows. Then one additional sprint, we're using Agile, so sprint is actually three weeks. We needed three more weeks to stabilize it. So three weeks to get the thing running, and three more weeks to get the thing running without, no, without any major bug. Now, the fight for Qt. So once, once we announced that we had decided to go for Qt as a platform abstraction layer, we got, I think, the typical questions that uh, this, both internally and externally, things like, yeah, but Qt is for, for GUI programming. Well, we are an example that it's not only for GUI programming. But Qt is monolithic. Well, it might have been monolithic like in 3.0, like the Roman Empire era, but it's not monolithic, any, monolithic anymore. Well, I heard this, mor this morning that now the, you, know, you, you guys consider it monolithic. We don't consider it monolithic. We just picked the modules we needed, and it just worked. We didn't, there, were, there were no interdependencies in there. But Qt is for, for C++. This is, um, this is linked to the fact that many uh, you know, embedded platform developers have this preconceived idea that if you want to you know, limit your memory footprint, C is the answer to it. I'm going to try to prove in this presentation that it is not necessarily the case. But Qt is big, but Qt is not enough cross-platform. Well, it might not be enough cross-platform, but in our case, when we needed to port it to Windows, Qt allowed, it, allowed us to do that, uh, and the cross-platform 
supposedly cross-platform library that we were using didn't allow us to do that. So f right from the beginning, it was more cross-platform than what we, ha we had been using. Okay, so in order to answer those questions, those, you know, those um, reluctancy, both internal and external, you have to educate your audience. So you have to, th first of all, you have to start with your own team, your own developers. So we were setting up some, you know, some tech talks there where we were explaining, you know, the Qt event loop, Qt singleton and slots, how it works, uh, encouraging people, for instance, to use uh, Qt Creator, things like this. Um, we also, you know, try to you know, defend um, the Qt, Qt, Qt standpoint to internal external stakeholders. That was focusing rather on memory. Uh, I'm going to talk about it later. But the thing is that in order to do that, in order to lead the way, you have to know the path. You have to know where you're going. So that means that beforehand, we had to go there and learn ourselves how Qt worked, how the object and, and the event loop works, how to, you know, um, 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 how to say this, orient your application or, or your daemon in our case around an event loop so that you can get out, you know, get out of multi-threading, how, you know, how, how to use signals, how to use slots. Things like going to the kernel virtual machine system and being able to read, you know, the memory utilization of Unix, Linux processes in order to show that memory print, memory footprint was not a problem. We had to go there and, and look into it very, very low level. We had to think, do things like, rather than just downloading Qt, you know, the binaries for Linux or for Windows and just started playing around with it, we had to, buy, uh, to download the source code and then study, you know, these uh, macros for compilation, conditional compilation, so that we can cut down the memory footprint to the bare minimum so that we could actually improve that well, our claims were correct. Also, things like um, the licensing options that uh, Qt offers, so um, you, you just, we, have, we wanted to make sure right from the beginning that it wouldn't get in our way later on. So, um, this slide is, 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 um, is, is really about memory consumption. This was one of the, you know, the, the toughest fights we had. So this is showing the output of a script that we wrote, which is actually monitoring the memory usage of every single subcomponent of our system, okay? And it is done for every, so in the x-axis, this, this, every group of four bars is actually a single commit from a single developer. And so you can see the trend, meaning that we can actually easily see the impact in memory that a change set from an individual developer is having in our system. Okay? The y-axis is actually the, you know, the memory footprint in, in kilobytes. And just for curiosity, Qt sits here. So this is Qt core and this is Qt network. I'm going to talk about it later. So the message here is that we just didn't say, no, memory is not a problem, that's it, blah, blah. We just went down there and did our best to show that actually memory was not a problem even in embedded devices, or at least in the embedded devices we're supposed to be supporting. So how do we use Qt? We only use two modules, Qt Core and Qt Network. Um, so this is all we use from Qt. That's all we need. Everything is there. And, and for instance, recently we needed some XML functionality, and we had the choice of using, you know, Qt XML, which is advanced XML uh, um, features that are offered to you, or some sax based uh, you know, Qt XML string rhythm writer, which is actually part of Qt Core. So we had actually went for the second option because of this memory, you know, memory minimality idea in mind. Okay, <clears throat> and also we, we also using some, something which is very useful and we would like to mention, which is Qt Service. It's part of the Qt solutions. And it's actually allowing your system to be demonized on Unix or you know, make it appear as a service on Windows with relatively low effort. Um, we're very happy with it. Okay, so, so this ends the, the part of the talk that you know, I was kind of justifying and, and you know, sharing with you how we did, how we you know, got into QT, the, 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 QT, the Q train, and then how we, you know, we defend our, our standpoint. Now let me just introduce a couple of extensions that we didn't find in Qt, uh, but we needed. So we implemented them, and we'll be very happy to you know, contribute to the Qt community if somebody you know, finds them useful. So the first one is um, what we call interface events. So as we're working with the network, when you close to the network, you need, um, you need actually to be informed of network interface events, like an interface went up or down, for instance, when you, you know, switch on your small switch on your laptop, for instance, when a new interface is, is created, for instance, when you um, do a VPN, usually there is a, you know, a pseudo interface, like a, a virtual interface that is actually using one of the others, but we need, we need to be informed of all that, also, also for addresses. And there is no portable, portable way of doing that. 
Okay, so in, in BSD, for instance, you need a routing socket. On Linux, you need a, a, a netlink socket, so which, which are actually special sockets for, 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 the, you know, for doing those, those kind of things, but it's not portable. And on Windows, it's completely a different thing. You need, well, first of all, we, first we tried was this WMI interface, and then we got kind of 100% CPU uses problems. Uh, we didn't really make, could really make sense of that. And we switched to IP helper API, which is a set of system calls provided by Windows, which are not POSIX, of course, but that do the job, okay? So now we got to a place where we, we had what we wanted, but we had different code for different platforms. And then we came up with the idea of saying, okay, why not we wrap it up into a Qt-ish, or Qt-ish, network interface notifier class that you can use and you just don't care about what the platform is, uh, you know, how the platform is, is, is doing that job, that work. So this is, uh, a summary of it, I'm going to get a little bit more technical on this example. <clears throat> so this would be the, the class definition. Um, uh, it's a simplified uh, version, okay, of this class. So you define some flags, which, is, which are the event type. They are flags because some, several events can come up of, at the same time. You have a factory method that will give you an instance of this class or the class that is implemented in the particular uh, platform. And you define a signal which is actually the change event. So you get the event, which is one of these guys, or several of these guys, and the network interf interface name, which is uh, referring to, the, um, um, to, what, to what interface this, this, uh, this uh, event relates, okay? So once you have this, if you wanna use it, this is an example of a subscriber that would be using those events. So, um, so you start, you know, it's called an IE subscriber, so well, you, you start by, you know, defining a slot which will be handling that event and of course has the same signature of the signal. Here is just some debugging information and this, this, is, um, this is a simple example. Some, you know, this is um, some sanity checks. Uh, is, the, you know, is the interface valid by the time we are uh, handling it? And here that, that's where you would do your additional processing. For instance, if the event was that a, net, a network interface was deleted, probably you you want to do some housekeeping, housekeeping in your memory here, like freeing some, some structures you know, linked to that, uh, to that interface. Now, in Qt, if you have a class that defines a signal and another class that defines a slot and you think of using it for you know, using it together with the other, this is not enough. Uh, you know that you have to, to connect the signal and the slot. And in this example, that's what we do it in main. So we define the main event loop then we use the factory method I just presented and keep it in a scope pointer just for, uh, for convenience. We declare the subscriber and then we connect the signal defined by the first, we saw it before, to the slot defined by the second. And then we enter the, the main event loop. This is just an example of something we did. So if you're using this class, what is happening under the hood, whether it's Windows, uh, BSD or Linux, you don't care, just use this program this way. And just very quickly, because I think, I think I'm running out of time, uh, let me just introduce the second thing that we did, the second contribution, which is raw socket. Another thing you need when you're close to the network is what we call a raw socket. Um, you know, 80% of programmers who ever used a, a socket in their life, it's act actually a, almost like TCP, you know, level four socket, like TCP, UDP, uh, what, what else, right, what, what not. So here what we need is, we need to open a socket, but to a much lower point in the network. For instance, we're interested in sending our protocol data within Ethernet frames. This is what CDP is doing, and we need to be able to do that. So the answer to that was our Ethernet socket class, so it's the same idea as the network notifier. The only problem here is that, unfortunately, for instance, you know, the changes you need there are much, much more, much, much, much bigger. In Windows, for instance, you can't do it. There's no way that Windows allows you to do that. So what you have to do is you have to write your own driver, open a file descriptor to your own driver, and then do you know, the stuff, uh, and this is what we did. But then that means that if you want to use that object, you have to install the driver. So it's not as easy as just you know, adding one new, one new object to the, to the Qt family. <clears throat> on units, for instance, it, 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 you can do it. There are, there are things, there, there's a thing such, which is called a raw socket, but you need to be root in order to open it. So then you have to be root. That means that you have to raise, reduce privileges so that you can palliate you know, the security implications that, uh, that have 
that, that, that entail that your application is running as root. So there's, there's some, some things, um, some, some side things that have, have to be done like uh, there. And so uh, just a, a new class is not solving it, just solving part of it. So the, given all that, um, you know, this code is there. It works. We are able to open raw sockets in you know, the three platforms. We have a wrapping class, QT's class, but it cannot just be done like that. You, you, need, you need to do um, lots of other things. But anyway, the code works, and we would be very happy to share with you if you're interested in it. So this is the, this is the def declaration of the, of, the low level so of the Ethernet socket. I'm not going to get into this. I don't have the time. Let me just uh, wrap up my talk. So I hope that I convince you in my talk that Qt is not only for GUI programming. We are the example. That Qt is not monolithic. That C++ and so Qt with it can be used in embedded platforms. This, this preconceived idea about, about C is not really true if you know what you're doing. And so Qt is not big if you know how to use it, how to tweak it, how to compile it. And the Qt is cross-platform. And the living proof that all these is true is our system Cisco MSI. Thank you very much. I'll take now questions. Th thank you very much, Sergio. The, um, I'm wondering whether you had any thoughts or initial reactions towards the announcements this week about uh, QNX and the other uh, embedded uh, uh, embedded uh, operating systems being, you know, getting more support and more focus from Digia. Um, do you think that's a good thing for uh, for projects like this? Yeah. So I think that's definitely very good news for us because so far, as far as I as as I am aware of. Or well, you know, most of the embedded platforms we're working with, it's us who's, who are somehow porting Qt there. And of course, we're doing it, you know, the minimal part of Qt that, that we are, you know, that, that we are using. So the fact that I see that the intention, you know, the long, long time intention is to support these or that embedded platform, that's very good for us because that means that probably some of the tweaks that you need, in order, you know, in order to, to run it, to have it running on that platform is gonna help us in our own platforms. So that's very good news. And even if the you know, set of platforms that you officially support is not matching ours, it's going to definitely be helping us. What kind of license do you use? So the li the, you mean the, the Qt license? Yes. So, so far, we're using LGPL for the moment. And anyway, the license of our own system is not clear yet. So far, it's being used internally. Now there are some talks about uh, you know having MSI running on third-party cameras and then you know digital media players. That's 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 on the air, but it's not just yet decided how we're going to monetize that in our system. So that means that you know so for, so far we're using LGPL, but you, we you know we might move on to the commercial uh, license if we need it need it in order to you know to ship it to third-party um, uh, companies. Thank you.